Georg, um, is a senior fellow at Bruegel. He's worked since 2009 on energy. He's been working in Ukraine for in and on and off for 15 years on energy issues. So he has three hats, which are very relevant. He's German, he's an energy expert, he's an Ukraine expert. So he's really the person who probably knows more about what he's going to be talking about. He co authored two papers, one on doing without Russian oil. He just published something yesterday on gas imports. So I'm really lucky to be able to have him here. And the slides are already showing. Um, the only rule here is that in order to pass slides, you will have to say next. Welcome, all of you. Uh, I will present each person at a time so that in the interest of time. Essentially, in August last year, we spotted first that uh, Gazprom is not filling its storages. And in October last year, we then started to track gas flows uh, from different uh, sources, LNG, but also uh, Russian um, gas flows into the European Union, seeing that something is, uh, is, uh, is blooming uh, that, uh, that we didn't like. Um, then at the end of last year, we did our first piece on whether we will be able to survive this winter. And our assessment was, well, if weather is fair, then we will make it. And that's what happened. But also Russian flows continued so far. And then at the beginning of this year, we issued two blog posts, one on uh, surviving without Russian gas and one uh, on uh, doing without coal and oil. And the message that I would like to bring across is, yes, we can do it and we can do it this year. So it is kind of if you count the, uh, the energy unit, it's, it's possible to uh, to replace Russian energy this year. The effects of that will, of course, be substantive because the amounts of Russian energy that we are getting are substantive still this year. Now, let me move you a bit through through a couple of um, uh, of fuels. So I'll start out with uh, with oil. Maybe next slide. Um, can we do? The, yeah, thank you. And so what we. Um, uh, what we what we do observe is that uh, Russia is a major oil exporter to the to the global economy, but Russian oil exports are very much targeted to the European market. So uh, you cannot, I mean, it's uh, probably better to to see it on the on the web. But what you can observe is that there is essentially a pipeline system that is quite strong that leads Russian oil to the European market, and then there are three big ports, two in the Baltic Sea, one in the Black Sea, that are sending Russian oil mainly targeted to the to the western market and this is a specific grade of oil this U urals oil and if europe were to stop buying this sort of oil it will be very difficult for russia to find a different place to to sell it to because it's a specific grade other uh, refineries are not really made for using this type of oil and you would have essentially to uh, to kind of drive it uh, across half of the globe in order to bring it to other markets so if europe would be willing to, for example, impose a tax or stop buying this oil, then Russia would have to uh, to, uh, to accept a significant discount or a significant loss of uh, income. Uh, you also see that Russia has some export capabilities towards the east. We expect that this capabilities they will continue to use and be able to use because that goes then to, to countries like China and uh, Europe will probably not be able to do something about it. The global implications of uh, uh, of such an oil ban would essentially be shared by everybody. So it will not only be Europe that will be affected because we have a global oil market. This effect might rebalance globally with higher kind of higher prices, increasing production in, in some oil exporting countries, reducing demand in other oil importing countries, and therefore the cost of an of an oil ban will be shared globally, not only to be have taken up by the European Union. Um, then let's uh, let's move to uh, to coal. Um, on the coal side, um, I think everything that that we hear is that um, Russia is has become a significant exporter of coal to the European Union in past years. Essentially, they pushed a lot of coal into the European market through low prices. But this can easily be reversed because the existing coal mines across the world, Colombia, Australia, South, uh, South Africa, are still available and could increase production. It might be that some of the coal qualities are not exactly the same coal qualities as uh, as, uh, as Russian coal. So we might potentially in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain phase, have to change some environmental rules on coal-fired power plants in Europe to be able to burn this, this other coal. But this is kind of a 
rather technical or regulatory issues and in a war economy uh, should be something that uh, that would be possible to do now what is interesting is that we not only have to replace russian coal by by other coal but we actually would have to import more coal because we have a lot of coal-fired power plants in the european union that are not running at full capacity think of the german network reserve there are a significant amount of coal-fired power plants there are still coal-fired power plants that uh, that are standing in germany that are not being being utilized lignite fired power plants that have been used less than they uh, than they could and in our assessment if you run them more you could replace maybe uh, a quarter to uh, to a uh, to a third of Nord Stream uh, one's uh, gas imports by just burning this uh, uh, burning more coal, producing more electricity. This electricity would then not be consumed necessarily in Germany, but potentially in Italy, where a lot of gas is used for electricity production. This tells you we need a European solution. Now, it does not work that uh, that uh, that Germany just thinks on its own about how can Germany replace uh, uh, Russian natural gas, but Germany must think okay. Okay, how can we produce more electricity that Italy can use to uh, reduce its natural gas dependence and how potentially Germany can get more natural gas than from, from other parts of the, of the European Union. So coal and oil seem to be feasible with somewhat increase in global prices potentially also triggering a bit of global economic cool down um, um, but the gas sector is obviously the, the most challenging one. Maybe one slide back. Um, one slide back, please. So, back. And one back. Uh, thank you. Um, so, if you look into European gas uh, supplies, uh, what you uh, what you see is that Europe can get gas from uh, from different sources. So, uh, Europe gets currently about 40% of its natural gas, or last year got about 40% of its natural gas from Russia. And replacing 40% of uh, of such an important fuel is is a significant challenge also because the other import facilities that Europe have not been built for kind of increasing the uh, the uh, the import by by such an amount so what we when we looked into the numbers uh, our assessment was that you need to do a 60 20 20 so 60 percent of the gas we are getting anyway from non-russian sources 20 percent so half of the Russian gas we can get through additional imports and this 20 percent uh, we actually are already exceeding that with current imports so it's impressive in the past three weeks lng imports of the european union if they would continue like that for the rest of the year we would import 100 bcm more than last year that is essentially two-thirds of the russian gas so if we manage to continue at the at the current pace we would all, uh, almost have replaced two-thirds of uh, of russian gas imports um but it's likely not to happen, so we might be able to replace maybe half of the Russian imports with, with alternative imports. And the other half we would have to replace by reducing our consumption. Now, how can Europe reduce its gas consumption? There's three main sectors. There's industrial sector, where you can see whether some um, kind of intermediate products like steel, basic chemicals like methanol, ammonia can be imported to keep our value chains running where you can try to phase down some production which is not essential for economic activity, maybe some paper production, um, um, maybe some glass production. Um, but the market might be able to, to deal with that and is already dealing with that. I mean, we see significant reduction in gas consumption in, in industry and we'll come up with a, with a corresponding post in the, uh, in the next day on how much that is. Uh, then you have the uh, electricity sector. I already spoke about the potential to shift to more coal and lignite. Uh, if oil is available on the market, one might even burn more oil. We might also want, and we have to do that, increase our activities in pushing in more renewables into the system uh, very quickly. And I think we should use the crisis situation as a catalyst to, uh, to, to go there. And then the last sector is the heating sector. And that's something for all of you and, uh, and everybody. I mean, we need to turn uh, turn down our thermostats we need to reduce the preheating temperature for our warm water and uh, and things like that if we all do it it is a significant amount so it's not uh, it's not peanuts that you uh, that you can contribute and with this kind of Barack Obama once called it all of the above approach we will be able to uh, uh, to uh, to manage uh, the next winter without Russian gas without crippling our economy 
without essentially having any uh, any significant blackouts in the European Union and without having people to freeze to death. So the challenge here will be organizing that in a uh, in a sensible way, but the numbers they are fitting. Uh, Karen uh, Pitel, who's the next speaker, she's a professor of economics at the University of Munich and the director of the Leibniz Institute for Economic Research for Energy, Climate and Resource Matters. She teaches uh, economics with a focus on energy, climate and exhaustible natural resources, and she's the co-author of the main paper that has caused all this all this discussion in Germany and that the Chancellor uh, last Sunday attacked. So we we have we have. Uh, um, uh, the two two of the authors who are going to split uh, discussing that. Um, Karen has to apologize because she's actually in a, in a speaking talk show this tonight in Germany, so she's going to have to run at one ten, so she won't be for the Q and A. But uh, but she will do now uh, her best to be super clear. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving the opportunity to present our findings here. Um, what we're going to do is actually two parts. Um, I'm going to start with some background facts on the dependency of Germany of imports, especially on gas, but also oil and coal a little bit. And then uh, in the second part, or and some distributional impacts actually of stopping imports um, of energy from Russia. And then in the second part, Ben uh, Moll over there is going to present the macroeconomic impacts of a uh, complete stop of uh, imports of gas. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Facts. Let's start with those. Um, just for a background information, so there is actually a high dependency, as by now should be clear, of the German economy of uh, primary energy imports. They from Russia, they amount to about 30% of our um, primary energy. And the the topic at hand, I don't think the rest is so important because we, as we heard, we can substitute um, hard coal, lignite we do have um, sufficiently, hard coal and uh, oil from the global markets. So gas is actually the problem at hand. And in 2020, um, it was estimated that we would uh, imported 55% of our gas from Russia. The numbers are not always coherent here. Some are a little bit lower um, because we have basically an accounting which shows the gross imports and the exports. And of course, how you assign the Russian gas then matters with respect to how much remains in Germany. Um, but these 55% are actually the important uh, number here. And if we go to the next slide, we actually see how this is uh, used in the different sectors in Germany. Uh, we see that households account for about a third, a little less um, than a third. So that would be the um, what Georg just mentioned, the temperature adjusting um, gas saving behavior that could apply here. Um, then we have only about 12%, which is really used for electricity generation outside of firm owned power plants. So for the general public and about 20% for district heating and uh, trade. And the bulk of the problem and the discussion is actually the industry. Um, that is about 37% of which, again, a share is uh, used for electricity production. The bulk is used for cold and heating purposes, some other stuff. And uh, then we have the material use, which will be hard actually to substitute for. But in the other areas, we're not always sure how much we can substitute in each process. Um, but that's also why we have price mechanisms that actually induce uh, the replacement of gas by other factors. Um, so perhaps next slide. Um, what we see here is actually how much the primary industries that use ga gas, uh, how much they account for in the German economy. So the primary three sectors would be chemicals, more or less um, general food industry, but also metal. And they account for about 60% of the industrial gas use. So um, not households, not trade and commerce. And you see also here uh, as a percentage on the right hand side, um, the share of these sectors in, for example, gross value added in employees and capital. And you see that the numbers are quite low. But of course, everybody would argue that, that this is relatively high up in the value chain. So you go from there. Um, down the value chain through the different applications of, of uh, chemicals, of steel, and so on. But of course, you also have. That's not me. It doesn't yes, sound like some, me. Somebody needs to be muted. Um, you also have. Um, we have 60 people online, so something like that. 
the option to actually replace um, in the downstream um, industries whatever is perhaps not produced in the same amount uh, in the sector as it was before a ban. Now, what you don't see now, because we kind of um, converted the slides to PDF, is actually, oh, we do see it. <laughs> it was somebody really smart, thank you. Um, that actually the 220 crisis with respect to the um, uh, importance of the sector that were most hit then, more downstream, um, but still, um, for example, air transport, um, um, entertainment, as well as hospitality, they amount to about the same. So it's not of a bigger, sh a bigger share that we're talking about here uh, with respect to the economy and with respect to employment, it's even less. I think that is good to keep in mind. Um, next slide, please. So now the question was, of course, um, do we have a supply gap if we have an import stop with respect to Russian gas? And uh, here we basically chose an approach that is much more pessimist as what um, um, Georg just present, pre, uh, presented, also kind of making sure that you have the worst case scenario and if it still works then, um, then you have good argument to actually push for something. So um, total gas use here you see is uh, about 1,000 terawatt hours. I mean, numbers vary a little bit. This is rounded. Um, then if we take the pessimistic number of 55% of German imports coming from Russia, that would make up uh, 550 terawatt hours missing. Although in the last months and year, we already decreased that share quite substantially. So more recent numbers, uh, talk about about 40 percent so the gap would automatically decrease then then we have additional imports and as um uh georg already pointed out there is some room especially with respect to lng for um, additional imports and we chose really pessimistic scenario here of just five percent um, additional imports so that's probably especially if there is well uh, conducted coordination on the european scale there is room for more so again, pessimistic or cautious. And um, then we basically also took account of uh, fuel switching options in the industry of, as well as in the electricity sector, some savings by households, um, and came up with about 200 terawatt hours that could be basically opted out of gas in the short run, just by switching from gas to coal, for example. So we have a remaining gap of 300 terawatt hours. And that is pretty much in line with other estimates that we have seen. And we're usually accused of being too pessimistic um, rather than too optimistic. So in that sense, that's good if it works. Um, OK, so we, the, these last 300, we basically have to substitute for. That's the shock that we have to the system. Next slide, please. And then the question is, of course, who is going to bear actually these or who has to come up with these 300 terawatt hours? And of course, there's different scenarios. A couple of them are listed here. Um, it could be either like dictated by regulatory um, means that it's only the industry or only the households um, or like a mix of both trade and commerce also contributing something or you could actually employ um, just a price driven mechanism. So prices go up and demand goes down. Some industries are seizing production for a while. Others are just not producing as much. So those are the two basic options. So saying we're reducing um, um, consumption at specific points or doing it price driven. And Georg is, um, ben is presenting then two scenarios, basically the one where we say everybody has to save about 30% of gas by what means ever, um, or it's going to be a price-driven mechanism. Okay, so much for present, preparing what um, Ben is going to do, but just showing you some numbers on the uh, distributional impacts of these uh, of this the supply gap and of the price increases. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So what you see here is basically that um, in Germany for households, the highest um, share of expenditures really for heating and gas. So that's a dark blue. And you see that we have the typical pattern that the richer a household, so the richest 10% are actually to the far right, the poorest are to the far left. And that's the share of their ex um, energy expenditure in their overall expenditure for consumption goods. 
And you see that gas is the most uh, important one here. You see also see, for example, with respect to actually fuels for, uh, for transport, the yellowish um, bar, that actually the poor households don't spend that much because they're usually driving smaller cars if they have cars at all. So in that case, you have not really this kind of like decreasing share, but more kind of, an, yeah, first increasing than decreasing. But you see, overall, it's of course um, relative to their expenditure, uh, the consumption expenditure. Poor households are in hit uh, um, hit most. Next one, um, you also see that it's especially small households, uh, one-person households, uh, for whom that makes a higher share. So, for example, if you have um, a single single mother, one child, that would be a harder hit than if you have a big family. It's just shown here for for the uh, one and the three person household. Next slide. But what you also see is, um, and this is probably hard to read. Um, this is not from us. This is from somebody else. Um, but it shows that um, within the groups, there's also a strong um, heterogeneity, meaning big differences within the groups. So here you have. Um, uh, again, income deciles, uh, so the 10% 10 poor, 10 poorest and so on. And on the left-hand side, you see the absolute amount of expenditure. So, of course, richer households are spending more on energy. But on the right-hand side, you see the relative, relative to income. So they can afford it, is basically the message. Um, but you also see that um, with respect to the blue scenario, for example, that's like the highest price increase of that study it was three scenarios middle, high, and extreme, um, red, yellow, and blue. And you see that there is, of course, uh, a lot of hetero heterogeneity, and uh, it really shows that you have to have good support systems for these um, vulnerable households, not only poor, but uh, also vulnerable. And next slide, please. So what you have to do if you actually are going to have an import stop or a decrease in Russian imports, which are going to increase the, the energy price, is really have a targeted policy. And by targeted policy, I mean one that takes account of the fact that if you have high energy prices, of course, they're signaling save gas, save fuel, and so on. So you do need the high prices on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, not everybody can afford them. Um, second point is um, you actually have a lot of claims on public money at the moment. You have it for infrastructure, new infrastructure like new pipelines, new LNG terminals, but also everything else that comes with decarbonizing and that's basically getting out of gas, uh, your economy. So there's a lot of stuff that apart from the um, war, et cetera, um, that we need to support. So make it as efficient as possible how you support the households. And always keep in mind the state is not really um, responsible for, and that's my personal opinion, I'm not sure whether everybody shares that, uh, responsible for ha helping rich people um, over um, like dealing with high prices. We have a market economy and we are bearing, uh, we are enjoying all the fruits from that. So we can also bear the negative effects of it if we are rich enough to pay. If you're too poor, the state has, has to be the insurance policy. And for that, we need basically policies that um, compensate the poor. So adjusting income uh, tax tariffs for the poor. Having, for example, lump sum payments with respect to either, for example, um, mobility, gas, having um, lump sum payments for um, heating, perhaps depending on how much you use in the past, because if you're poor, you have an old, inefficient heating, you can't just change it. So basically, taking account of that as well as possible, while at the same time being fast. I think that's the challenge, because we can't have a super complicated mechanism that is going to work in half a year. So that's the trade-off. But still, we have to really try to make it as efficient as possible to support the groups that need it most. Ben is, is the next person talking, and he's one of the top macroeconomists in the world. He's one of the experts, worldwide experts on on, on, on economies with with very complicated economies with many people, uh, different different people, and he got a prize, that one of the most prestigious prizes for the his study of the interactions between inequality and, and macroeconomy. And he's a co-author of this paper, and he's going to continue explaining, laying out for you uh, in this kind of extreme scenario, uh, what would actually be uh, the cost to the economy. Thank you. Great.
Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so I'll just uh, keep keep going, essentially. So uh, Karen told you the, the facts, essentially. Um, now what we do sort of in the second part of the paper is sort of starting from these empirical facts, so the energy dependence and in particular gas dependence of the German economy and so how large these shocks could be in the in the worst case scenarios and what we know about what industries, uh, uh, you know, use this gas and so on. We try to map this uh, th this shock into predictions about what would happen to the aggregate economy. So in particular, what would happen to things like gross domestic product and, you know, what what would happen to the output of these industries. So, for example, just, you know, to put this on the table again, um, Karen already had this. Um, gas uh, is relatively small. So uh, if you just look at it, uh, the, the importance of gas in the aggregate economy um, in sort of euro terms, it's one 0.2% of uh, gross national expenditure, which is roughly the same as GDP. Um, at the same time, the gas shock is large, you know, minus 30%, but also not uh, uh, minus 100%. Okay, uh, next, please. So what we're going to do essentially is we're going to use uh, a series um, of economic models uh, to do this mapping from the facts uh, to these aggregate GDP losses. Why a series? Because we don't want to, you know, put too much weight on just one model. I think it's good practice to, you know, acknowledge this uncertainty about, you know, how exactly the world works. And so uh, uh, that's what we're doing. And other people from other teams have also done their own uh, simulations. And I think, as we'll talk about in the end, they all come to roughly sort of similar magnitudes in the end. Um, <clears throat> okay. So... No, stop. So th there's an important thing which, no, can you go back, please? Um, there's an important thing which is, uh, uh, you know, there already in our simplest possible model, which is uh, uh, that gas has a small expenditure share in the economy, um, but, uh, so that makes you think that, you know, the effect wouldn't be too large. But the problem, of course, is that the substitutability with other factors may be small. So it's sort of a critical input in production, okay? Um, just to tell you sort of how to think about this from a theoretical uh, point of view a little bit, um, I want to give you two sort of extreme scenarios um, that I would say sort of are nonsensical um, and inconsistent with data. And then I want to tell you that the world lies somewhere in between. OK, so here are the two things you don't want to do. OK, the two things you don't want to do is you, you don't want to just say, oh, the GDP loss will be something like, let's take the share of gas in, in, in GDP and multiply that with the shock. So that would be like 1% times uh, minus 30%, so 0.3%. So that would be too low, right? Uh, why? Because gas is sort of this critical uh, bottleneck in production. The other thing that would also be a crazy thing to do would be to say, there's no substitutability um, of gas whatsoever. It's a, a sort of completely critical input that you you know cannot substitute at all anywhere along the production chain. Okay, and in, in which case you would think that if gas falls by 30%, um, everything sort of breaks down and the entire GDP declines by 30%. Okay, that's the other crazy scenario. Okay, and so uh, what we want to argue is you want to you we're, we're somewhere in between, and the question is sort of. Um, if you look at the data, where in between are we? Okay, and it's going to turn out the case if you you know use empirical estimates of substitutability in a sense I'll explain later. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's going to turn out that you're much closer to the 0.3 percent rather than the minus 30 percent. So you're going to get numbers like maybe uh, 3 percent. So you're going to get like an amplification relative to the 0.3 percent of like a factor of 10, but you're not going to get an amplification of a factor of 100. OK, like as you would get to go from 0 0.3 to 30 percent, which would then be sort of the mass poverty scenarios that that sort of Havik is talking about. OK, next slide, please. So um, th there's some important features that in the debate people have pointed to and that we wanted to have in our uh, uh, theories, in particular in sort of our our second uh, model. Um, these are in particular these production chains, so production cascades. Right? The idea that, I'm um, saying, uh, the chemicals industry uses gas um, uh, to produce plastics, then plastics get used to produce food packaging and so on, or that, it, uh, that the steel industry is affected and steel is used in automobile production and so on. So these kind of knock-on effects, okay? And we have a model that has exactly that. We teamed up with uh, David Bakai, who's a... Uh, uh, you know, one of the world experts on, on these sort of uh, production chains, and we got uh, their model. So that's going to tend to make these numbers larger because you have these knock-on effects. It's not just the upstream industries that are affected. Um, and then the other thing we wanted to have in a model, because we think it's important, is uh, international trade. 
Um, why? Because uh, uh, we think that, you know, it's important that we're not just uh, closed islands, these countries, um, and you can potentially uh, import uh, some of the goods that you may not be able to produce anymore because they become too expensive. You may be able to import them from abroad. So the first thing, these production chains make the effects larger. Okay. And the second thing, uh, trade will tend to make the uh, effects a little smaller. Okay. So um, there's an important mechanism um, in, in all these models um, uh, that, that that's going to be at play. And uh, uh, how big you think these effects are going to be is going to depend a lot on, you know, how optimistic or pessimistic you are going to be about that. And that mechanism is sort of substitution in the broad sense of the world. Okay. Um, what I mean here is not just, so there's going to be product substitution, sorry, along the production chain that we talked about. Um, so you may at some point, you know, replace the gas either or one of the sort of more downstream inputs, but then also across sort of production processes. So we think what's going to maybe happen is, you know, there's going to be some production processes that are very reliant on gas and they're going to become too expensive, um, but then they're going to be replaced by other production processes um, uh, that are maybe, uh, you know, use green energy and are not as expensive anymore. Um, there's something sort of important to point out, which is, um, you know, people always say, oh, because gas is the sort of very upstream sector, um, uh, you know, if you take out gas, everything's going to uh, collapse because it's going to just, you know, filter along the production chain. I think that's important, but at the same time, you also have to acknowledge that sort of essentially the longer the production chain, the more uh, parts there are for substitution. So, you know, maybe... Um, we cannot produce uh, plastics anymore. Plastics production is going to become expensive and that, you know, it's going to uh, be complicated for, for producing food packaging, but then we can just import the plastic, uh, for example, or use, uh, you know, paper for packaging and so on. Okay. Um, there's lots of, or, or fertilizer is another example, right? People are uh, worried about, um, uh, you know, gas is an import into fertilizer production. Um, but, I, you know, I think to a certain extent, we just say, well, maybe we can just import the fertilizer. That would be too bad for, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the specific firms uh, producing fertilizer, um, but, you know, it wouldn't totally destroy the production chain, basically. Okay. There's lots of important historical examples of this type of uh, substitution taking place, and in particular episodes where, you know, there's large scarcity or large events where uh, things change a lot, so there's, there's huge necessity uh, tend to be uh, 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 events where uh, substitution or this adaption, adaptability of the economy becomes important. And I just wanted to give you uh, very briefly sort of three such examples, and we wrote like a little uh, supplement of our paper where we have more such examples. Okay, so there is actually sort of a a mini um, example of a of an uh, oil import embargo. Okay, um, in particular in. Uh, uh, 2019, I think, um, there's a pipeline that goes from uh, Russia to Germany, um, uh, the Druzba pipeline, um, that was uh, actually shut down, uh, not because, you know, we shut it down or Putin shut it down, but because um, there, uh, there was some contamination in the pipeline and they had to basically sort of clean it and, and shut it down because of that. Okay? Now, it turns out that next to that pipeline, there's all the oil refineries um, in, in, in East Germany. Okay. And so you may have thought, okay, everything's going to break down if that pipeline, uh, uh, you know, shuts down. But that wasn't the case. Why? What did they do? Well, they just sent the oil by ship instead. Okay. So this is just a simple example. There's uh, bigger examples um, from World War II in particular, has a lot of examples of such substitution. Um, one I like is uh, uh, plane manufacturing in the United States. Okay. So essentially what happened is President Roosevelt uh, uh, came out and said, Okay, we need 50,000 planes uh, to fight in, in World War II. Um, and he sort of presented that as a challenge to industry and so on. Essentially, every industry person, um, all economists also said, no, that's impossible. Okay, um, cannot just, you know, produce 50,000 uh, planes out of nowhere. Two years later, they not only produce 50,000 planes, they produce 100,000 planes in a single year. Um, how did they do that? They uh, adapted... Um, production techniques, in particular the assembly line from automobile manufacturing. Okay, so the point is there's just adaption. Another example that you may remember uh, fondly or not so fondly is face masks during COVID. You may remember in the beginning of the pandemic, everyone's like, oh God, we don't have any face masks. Um, a few weeks later, there are like plenty of face masks to go around. Um, th there's some more examples like that. I, so the point is, I guess, a little bit 
Um, this is, I, I think it's a German saying, um, sort of necessity is the mother of invention. So, you know, if we have to do it, people uh, uh, come with all sorts of things. So the market economy, I think it's important to emphasize, is very adaptable uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, this is something we have to uh, rely on here rather than sort of trying to plan sort of uh, essentially everything. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so here are the numbers that we get out of these models. And the model on the left, um, uh, so the first column here is this uh, uh, multi-sector model with production chains. Um, and then the two columns uh, uh, that they're a simple model um, are uh, these, these, these simpler models um, where we, we just use them to do some really pessimistic worst case scenarios, okay? The numbers we get out of what we think is actually probably the most realistic model, at least if you think about sort of medium run uh, scenarios is uh, on the left, so 0.3% of GDP. Um, so that's roughly like 100 euros um, per person, okay? Uh, so kind of very small and manageable number. We think that maybe in the very short run, that uh, number is too small, okay? Um, uh, in particular, because it assumes uh, that there's this import substitution, so this adaption through imports, and we think, you know, forming trade linkages takes some time. So we don't want to just rely on... Therefore, we also have these two other scenarios um, that are in columns two and three, um, where essentially we don't allow for any trade, okay? Uh, and uh, we just... And, and we, you know, put very low substitutability of gas uh, with other factors. And there, and, and disciplined by empirics, basically. And there we get that uh, you get worst case scenario, 2.2% uh, GDP loss, okay? Um, which then we sort of... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. To get at our headline number, we sort of round it up to 3% to say, you know, that's what we think is the worst case, okay? Um, for comparison, just to link it to something that Karen said before, um, it's kind of important how this shock gets distributed across different sectors, okay? So I think um, from talking to people in Germany, um, what you hear a little bit coming out of the, the ministries also, is there's somehow the scenario that um, the entire shock or 90% or 60% or of the shock is going to fall on industry, okay? Um, if that happens, just to be clear, it, also in our model, it would be a catastrophe, okay? If you just let the entire shock, so say 9% of the shock fall on industry, that would then mean that, you know, gas would fall by 66% in industry, we would get very large output losses. But, you know, there's something you can do about it. In particular, you can uh, uh, let the price mechanisms do their work, and you can also maybe prioritize industry. So there's always the story, BASF needs at least 50% of its gas uh, supplies, otherwise they need to shut down. Well, but, I mean, then we can just, you know, make sure they get 50% of their gas supplies because the total gas supply only falls by 30%, so it's, so it's okay. Um, okay, so let's keep going. So this model or this, this sequence of model misses a bunch of things. Um, in particular, uh, it misses some standard business cycle amplification mechanisms, um, and there's some frictions that sort of may amplify these initial shocks, okay? So, for example, there's sort of the standard Keynesian um, aggregate demand multipliers. Um, so people have less income, then they spend less, and that, that uh, you know, means uh, they buy less stuff and, and so on and so forth. So it's standard, standard mechanism. That's not in our, sta in, in our baseline model. Um, uh, and there's also no financial frictions. Um, I'll come back to that. So what we do, uh, you know, to compensate for that, we essentially um, just go with very, very pessimistic numbers for the things we have in our model. So we essentially went to the empirical literature. We looked up numbers for substitutability um, of these different inputs and goods. And we basically always took the lower bound of the estimate in literature and then half that. OK, um, and then the other thing we did is we always rounded up all our numbers. Why? Why? Because we wanted to have some sort of a, a, a safety margin. And we focused on this model where there's no trade. Um, OK, let me let me skip that. I'll, I'll get back to some of this. OK, can we get to the next slide, please? OK, um, I'll go fast here and just give you a flavor. So there was a debate in Germany, essentially, um, that, oh, we shouldn't trust these numbers because they don't have these business cycle amplification mechanisms. Um, and I think to a certain extent it was a fair criticism, but I mean, essentially what did we do? We just, you know, incorporated, incorporated them. In particular, there's a, a team led by one of my co-authors who then put in these amplification mechanisms. And, you know, to make the, the long story short, um, it gives you some amplification, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it 
it's it, it still means that you know we had put 2.2 percent of gdp and we rounded up to three three percent um if you incorporate this amplification you still be to stay below three percent essentially so you're still sort of not in mass poverty a scenario in fact like extremely far away from it um next slide please so these are from a model um some uh uh, uh time paths of what these models predict in terms of um, gdp this is in german so bip for example there on the left means gdp and you can see it sort of drops by three percentage points. The other thing that's nice about these kind of models is you can think about inflation um, and monetary policy, okay? And so what these models definitely do predict as well is that uh, we would get an increase in inflation from a from a uh, uh, an import uh, stop. Uh, in particular, you can see there the, the graph that says inflation. So inflation increases there by something like two percentage points. Um, so that's substantial, okay? But it's, again, not like 10 percentage points, okay? Um, the other thing you can think about there is what should monetary policy uh, do? And I think it's pretty clear if you think about the economics of this is that monetary policy should uh, sort of lean against the wind um, and increase uh, uh, interest rates. Okay, so let me uh, uh, sort of go to the next slide, please. Um, conclusion here. Um, so the costs of an embargo, um, we would say are substantial, but not catastrophic. Um, ballpark numbers is uh, in terms of aggregate effects and also effects on particular industries. Um, they're somewhat smaller than COVID, a worst case, a 3% GDP impact. This is a very conservative estimate, okay? Uh, it's important to uh, 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 um, emphasize. And the distribution of costs is sort of uh, distributed uh, across households in a uh, you know, manageable way. Next slide, please. Okay, just some policy takeaways, uh, you know, which either if we end up doing this embargo or if Putin, uh, you know, ends up shutting our, our gas supplies from his side, I think it's also important to think about that scenario, okay? Here, here's some policy takeaways. Karen already said some of this, okay? I think it's important you want to make sure that price mechanisms work, okay? Why? Because we do want the prices on gas and oil and coal to increase to a certain extent so as to get people to substitute away from these goods, okay? We don't want to substitute petrol. Instead, we want to, if, if anything, substitute, uh, subsidize, sorry, um, alternative energy sources. We want to subsidize maybe, you know, green energy because we want people to make the switch. Um, we don't want the shock to fall entirely on either industry or households. I told you this could get bad. We do probably want central banks to raise interest rates to a certain extent to rein in inflation. Um, bad fiscal policies that you don't want to do, again, I've already said sort of uh, putting uh, hard caps on prices, I think, um, and uh, subsidies. Um, more generally, I think you basically want to use the same uh, uh, policy package that we already used during COVID. So we said the, 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 the uh, recession would be sort of a little bit similar to COVID in the sense that it's very unequally distributed across sectors um, and in terms of magnitude as well. Um, the point is we know how to deal with this to a certain extent. So in Germany, for example, we have these short-term uh, work arrangements, Kurzarbeit, uh, we would use this. Um, if push comes to shove, um, you know, and some companies um, really suffer balance sheet losses, um, uh, the state may have to step in and bail them out, okay? So for example, during the COVID crisis, um, the state stepped in and uh, bailed out Lufthansa and, uh, you know, uh, took a partial ownership stake in Lufthansa. If now push comes to shove, absolute worst case scenario, uh, you know, it may be possible that the state would have to uh, partially um, uh, take ownership of uh, BASF, the chemical company, for example, okay? Um, next slide, please. So just some words of caution to conclude. Um, so here's very clearly what we do not say, okay? We're not saying that an embargo is the only or best uh, a policy option. Uh, there's lots of uh, other policy options on the table, for example, a tariff, and there's these ideas of escrow accounts that we where we sent the money. Uh, there's these ideas of more sort of fine-tuned ratcheting sanctions where we, you know, ratchet up the sanctions, the more atrocious uh, uh, Putin's war crimes are and so on. I think these are all uh, uh, good uh, options to discuss. What we wanted to do here is just basically give a worst case assessment. If we go full cold turkey, what would happen? Okay, so next point, please. Here's what we do say again. Um, we think that even in this extreme cold turkey scenario, the embargo is sort of in size comparable to the COVID recession. Okay, uh, maybe a little smaller actually. 
Um, and that was a recession in which we were able to uh, provide insurance and socialize these costs. So we think that at least in principle, um, uh, uh, we don't see any reason in principle why that shouldn't be possible again. Maxime uh, Chapeliev is a research economy at produce, uh, economist at Purdue University. He received his PhD in the National Academy of Science in Ukraine, and he's been working in the Ukrainian energy sector and the internal linkages between energy transition, emissions, and development. He's co-authored a, pa a paper on short-term pain for long-term gain on the cut of Russian oil fuel exports. Please. Many thanks, and thanks for providing an opportunity to present our work here. And this is a joint paper with my colleagues from Purdue, with Tom Hertel and Dominic Mandermans Brugge. Next, please. So what I will talk here is first like a bigger picture on impacts on EU in general, then we'll zoom in into some country specific um, impacts and also distributional uh, outcomes for the most impacted countries. Um, and then we will also talk about long term implications of, of this move. So we, we find some su substantial environmental co benefits from um, this uh, possible uh, restriction on, on imports. Then we'll also touch on potential impacts on the Russian economy and, and then we'll conclude. Um, so in, in terms of the importance of this step, the revenues from fossil fuel exports represent over one third of, of uh, Russia's total budget, and half of this amount is contributed by EU. So if these revenues were to be cut off, of course, this could have a tremendous impact on Russian um, economy and, and possibility of financing its military operations. Um, US and UK have already uh, announced uh, the move of banning energy imports from Russia, though, of course, for them, the stakes are much, much lower than for EU. Um, for EU, the share of imports from Russia in total imports from all sources varies widely across fuels, so from around 22% for the case of natural gas and up to 36-37% uh, for the cases of coal and petroleum products, and this is figure on the left. Um, so when considering import dependency, it's important to take into account their um, domestic production uh, volumes. And, and when we take that into account, um, the use import dependency on Russian fuels is, uh, of course, lower. It does not exceed 28% for the case of crude oil, 9% for petroleum products. Um, it's also important to point out that while it's hard to substitute natural gas, as, as previous speakers have already mentioned, in value terms, oil and petroleum products constitute 65% of, of total value flow. So, so focusing on those is also very important in terms of influencing uh, their policy debate. Um, the level of energy dependency also widely varies by countries. Um, so across individual EU member states, uh, mostly Eastern European and Baltic countries are at the top of the list. Uh, and this, of course, implies a heterogeneity of impacts across countries. Um, um, impacts of cutting Russian energy imports would also largely vary in terms of the time frame. So we would observe very different implications for the short term, like an immediate impact when the possibility of switching to another source of import and um, uh, are limited, and in the longer term when when there would be a better possibility of increasing imports from um, other sources and uh, ramping up the domestic uh, supply. Um, next, please. So in this presentation, we explore both of these um, kind of time frames, and we apply a um, state-of-the-art uh, global economic modeling framework where we take into account all the substitution possibilities and um, intersectoral linkages. So we try to represent kind of how this shock can realistically penetrate across the economy taking into account, uh, account the price impacts and how it would impact consumption and production, intermediate use. And, and we look into three scenarios uh, where we cut uh, um, energy imports from Russia by 70, 80, and 90 percent. Um, and we call these scenarios uh, substantial high and severe kind of scenarios, respectively. Um, so first, on, on the like, overall global picture, our results suggest that at the aggregate EU level, such import restrictions could lead to an increase in energy prices um, anywhere between 7 and 10 percent. And, and prices of transportation, like mostly public transportation, by around 4 or 5 percent. Um, and this would translate to their 
reduction in their annual real income growth rate of approximately 0 0.4, 1.1%. So for instance, if, if the projection of the uh, income growth rate is 3%, this move would reduce the growth rate to, let's say, 2%. So it doesn't mean an actual decline, but just a reduction in growth rate. Um, next, please. So these impacts would vary largely across countries and households. Um, and as I mentioned, we found that Eastern European and Baltic member states are not only more dependent on energy imports from Russia, but their households also spend on average a higher share of their budget of, on energy and transportation. So at, at least 10%. And on this slide, you can see the listing of, of the top countries with the highest kind of expenditure shares. Um, and, and consumers in these countries could be more vulnerable to, to this particular uh, move of restricting energy imports. Um, so we took into account the shares of household expenditures and, and focused on our um, kind of high scenario, which is a central one with 80% reduction in energy imports. Um, and, and this scenario translate into the consumer price increases on average for you around 0.6%. So less than 1% increase in, in consumer price index. Um, some countries like uh, Estonia, Hungary, Czech Republic would experience a consumer price index decrease closer to 1%, 0.8%. And we found that Bulgaria is particularly kind of could be particularly impacted by this move considering its household consumption structure. With a, but, but again, consumer price index would rise a little bit over 1%, 1.1% in the case of Bulgaria. Um, so we then uh, zoomed into the case of Bulgaria as potentially the most impacted country. So again, kind of representing the most um, kind of severe case yeah, of potential impacts. And we looked into the distributional impacts for, for this country. Um, so um, we, we should take into account that um, since lower income households, as, as mentioned in the case of Germany, also spent more on energy, uh, in the case of Bulgaria, around 14% for their lowest kind of decile, so the 10% of poorest households spent around 14% on energy, while the 10% of the um, kind of richest household spent around 9% on, on energy. So when we take that into account, we find some heterogeneity in, in price increases across different household types. But again, the, it's 1.3% it's for the poorest, 10% and around 1% for the richest. So this is the level of, of impact that we can um, expect. Um, at the same time, it, it should be noted that these price increases are nowhere near historical variations in energy prices. So, for instance, when we compare energy prices in, in 2011, which was a year with very high oil prices, and, and 2021 energy prices, in, in 2011 energy prices were 57% higher than, than in 2021. So, and even in that year, um, the total household expenditure on energy in Bulgaria did not uh, exceed 12.5%. Um, next, please. So now we move into the longer term implications, yeah, because those would be very different from the short term implications. In the long run, um, EU economy would be able to kind of adapt better to the shock with uh, you know, increasing imports and domestic supply. And, and when we look into these longer term implications, what we see is that uh, the magnitude of adverse impacts is much lower. Yeah. So by 2030, so we focus on, on up to 2030, by 2030, the cumulative reduction in real income is, is only 0.4% from a relatively strict reduction in, in imports. So when we, when we convert it in, into the annual average growth rate reduction, it's, it's like 0.05%. So it's really a very small number that's if we take into account this longer term implications. At the same time, we find very substantial co environmental co-benefits from this move. So the reduction in, in carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 is 6.6% uh, uh, relative to our reference case. We also find reductions in, in other air pollutants, which have a tremendous impact on um, um, premature deaths. So this would also benefit their um, health implications. And we also find that major restrictions on, on energy imports uh, could 
play an important role in achieving the EU Green Deal uh, mitigation goals. So in, in our reference case, CO2 emissions reduced by 48.5% in 2030 relative to 1990. And the ban on, on um, energy imports would, would further move this reduction to 52%. Yeah, so for the EU Green Deal, we need a 55% reduction in emissions relative to 1990. And the ban on energy imports from Russia allows to to go the halfway to, to the EU Green Deal relative to reference scenario. We also find that this emission reduction from Ben is equivalent to 40 euro carbon price. So this could potentially reduce the carbon price within the UTS by, by around 40 euro, just this Ben. Um, next, please. So before concluding, we also looked into what what is at stake for the Russian economy? So would these major restrictions in energy imports from Russia be enough to impact the country's decision-making process? And, and our estimates suggest that, well, it, it should be because uh, such bans would come at a tremendous cost for Russian economy. So even, even considering the potential of relocation of Russian exports of fossil fuels in the long run, we find that um, the adverse impacts for Russia are 10 times those for EU, yeah, in, in relative terms, in terms of real income and exports. So the, the immediate reduction in real income would be around 6% relative to baseline, and then it would increase to 8% by, by 2030. Our estimates also suggest that, you know, cumulatively by 2030, real income in Russia would, would reduce by 1 trillion euro and, um, and export revenues Lost export revenues would be around 1.1 trillion euro. Um, next, please. So, so to conclude, the, the reliance of Russian economy on fossil fuel export is tremendous. So, so this move by you is has really a high potential to impact the decision making in the country. With even with 70% cut in energy imports from Russia, EU would would achieve a number of goals. Um, including a major reduction, major cut in, in Russian export revenues flows, and uh, b, uh, the, the impacts for you under this 70% reduction would be relatively moderate, yeah, uh, and in, in par from what previous speakers have um, already discussed. So the real income you know, reduction by less than 1%, energy prices increase between 7 and 8%, um, and this could also allow to overcome some technical constraints that, in particular, financial gas that have been discussed and, and also um, mentioned in some other studies. Uh, but even at a higher level of restrictions, economic outcomes are, are very manageable for you, even, even including when we focus on the kind of countries with the lowest income, like Bulgaria, and in the poorest households, yeah, uh, the poorest 10%. Um, so, Again, as mentioned, additional policy efforts might be needed to protect the most vulnerable um, from this uh, particular outcome. And, and the last but not least, in the long run, we find substantial environmental co-benefits. Yeah, so um, it would reduce uh, EUTS uh, carbon price substantially by around 40 euro, also achieve reductions in CO2 emissions and, and air pollutants. And I'll stop here. Thank you. No, no, really, this is a slide. It's, it's just my con the concluding slide before we give uh, praise to the Q&A. You cannot read it very well, but the key column is the one in the middle. It's not from me. It's from the Council of Economic Adv Advisors of Germany uh, that actually produced a slide showing what are the losses in the different models. Not the one that you saw here, but by other economists in other contexts. You see that no number here is bigger than 3%. There is, I mean, if you just think, if you just keep a couple of facts in mind from this presentation, 1.2% um, is gas, 0.30% of that you're taking out. I mean, to get to mass poverty, the kind of things you have to, you would have to do to the data would be insane. I mean, nobody has any number that approaches what we have seen with COVID in some of our countries. And I mean, what, what our objective here is, is to say, look, politicians and people you work for, or the MEPs that are here, have to think about values and they have to think about how much they care about peace and democracy and all the things we care about in Europe. But they also have to think about cost and benefits. And this workshop has tried to be just about that. Cost and benefits. We haven't talked about how many people are dying. We haven't talked about the risk to our security if the borders of, the, of Russia come to Poland, about what are the huge 
losses in investment and the uncertainty that's going to cre be created if we have a, a, an enemy that, that becomes stronger, in part thanks to our help. All of those things we have left on the side. We have just told you what are our, what does the work in economics, and here is the Council of Economic Advisors, so these people uh, are not just taking the, 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 the ideas here, but everyone, including the ECB. You see the second and third numbers are from the ECB. Um, uh, ECB. Uh, and you just don't get numbers that are basically bigger than 3% than from any independent economist. So that's the purpose of, 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 of our seminar, to just bring you over to just thinking of this. I don't understand how the German government got itself into this cor cor corner where they are trying to, where they have gotten themselves to argue something about mass poverty, which literally makes no sense. I mean, it just makes no sense. But we need to kind of try to inject rationality back into discussion. Uh